back. Mr. Chambers is going to continue reading from Powerless by Matthew Cody today. Today we are in chapters 22 and 23. It's our second to last video in this reading of Powerless by Matthew Cody. And as always, your activity for today's reading is to A, draw a picture of a scene from what I read, and B, write a short one paragraph, three to five sentence paragraph, summarizing the details of what happened. Tell me who, what, where, when, why. Summarize the story. With that being said, let's begin with today's reading. Powerless by Matthew Cody, chapter 22. The Cave. When he came to, the first thing Daniel was aware of was the pain. It was a familiar throbbing agony that originated in his left arm and washed over him in waves. The second thing was the cold. This being November, there was a chill to the evening air, but this cold bit like a deep winter freeze. Rough stone scraped against his face. The air smelled wet like earth. Daniel stretched his fingers out into the darkness. There were none of the faint shadows or telltale shapes that you might find in a dark room. This was a darkness that was total and absolute. Daniel brought his good arm up to his face and waved his fingers in front of his eyes to confirm his worst fear. He was blind. Do you know where you are? asked the darkness. Daniel froze and listened to the voice, raspy like crinkling sheaves of old paper, a voice he knew and feared. Plunkett? Daniel asked. Yes, Mr. Corrigan. The voice was close. He could be standing right over Daniel and Daniel wouldn't even know. I, I can't see. I know. But you haven't answered my question. Do you know where you are? How can I know where I am if I can't see? Daniel heard Plunkett, the real Plunkett this time, not the muffled whisper of the shroud, give an exasperated sigh. But Daniel didn't care. He was focusing all his might on keeping the panic out of his voice, even as the encompassing darkness threatened to swallow him whole. He was fighting the claustrophobia brought on by the blindness and concentrated on keeping his breath even and steady. You have other senses, said Plunkett, and you have deduction, reasoning as well. Now I repeat, do you know where you are? Daniel forced himself to relax, and he stretched out both arms into the dark. Instantly, he regretted it as a burning pain raced up his bad arm. Plunkett's attack had undone weeks of delicate healing that had gone on beneath the cast. The bone had snapped a second time. He winced but he managed not to cry out. Ignore the pain. Fight through it, said Plunkett. He reached out again, this time with only his good arm, and he felt the ground he was lying on. It was definitely stone, cold and rough. He could hear the slight echo of dripping water nearby. We're in the quarry, behind your secret stone door. Very good. And do you have any thoughts as to what else might be behind my secret door? Daniel gritted his teeth and forced himself to breathe. What was Plunkett up with all of these questions? Was he just playing more games, toying with his prey? At last, this game was buying Daniel time. Every minute that he kept Plunkett talking was the minute Daniel stayed alive, and he increased his chances of finding and freeing Eric. 
So he buried his anger and fear and let his deductive mind get to work. I suppose that I, I suppose that it's something you want to keep hidden, something important to you. Yes. And before this was a quarry, it was the site of St. Albans Orphanage, wasn't it? Before it burned to the ground, before the night, the comet appeared over Mount Noble. Call it by its real name, boy. Mount Noble is a meaningless honorific. The ancient tribes who first settled in its shadow called it by a different name. Witch Fire Mountain. Noble had nothing to do with the secrets of this ancient place. There was a sudden change in Plunkett's tone, a defensiveness that hadn't been there before. So Jonathan Noble was a sore spot for him. But otherwise, your deductions were splendid, continued in the darkness. A top-notch bit of reasoning. Daniel's vision exploded in a field of white of shooting stars. It was more than a blindfold being ripped off his eyes. It was darkness itself peeling away from his eyelids. The pain was excruciating. When his vision cleared, his now tender eyes focused immediately on his adversary, Herman Plunkett the Shroud. He was sitting across from Daniel in a very different chair from the overstuffed recliner in his library. This one was made out of stone and earth, and it had appeared to be dug out of the very cave wall. Plunkett was playing with a strand of darkness, the same cold darkness that had just been peeled away from Daniel's eyes. It was thin like a fine filament string, yet fluid, ebbing and flowing between Plunkett's fingers. There were other strands of the stuff here and there about Plunkett's body as well, the remains of Plunkett's villainous shroud disguise. Plunkett merely watched as Daniel examined the rest of his surroundings. As he had suspected, he was in a limestone cave. Daniel could feel the cool wind of a draft upon his face. A kerosene lantern provided feeble light, enough to see by at least, but the shadows swallowed up everything beyond this small patch of light. So there was no telling how deep the cave went or how tall its ceiling was. Daniel could see well enough, however, to make it out. Eric's body lying just a few feet away. His friend was breathing softly, easily, but he was unconscious. Behind Eric was a small alcove into which sat the massive rolling door that Daniel had seen from outside. It was, of course, sealed tight. And the walls were covered in pictures. They were etched and stained into the very stone. Scenes of battle, of hunting, and of worship. The artwork was primitive and reminded Daniel of the cave paintings in Europe he had seen in pictures. These paintings were better preserved, though, and in most places the color was still vibrant. The detail was remarkable. These paintings had been hidden from the elements and from prying humanity for many years. Behind Plunkett's chair was another kind of mural, a collage of photographs framed and hung with care from the rocky wall like family pictures in a hallway. Such a modern affection looked out of place in this ancient cave. They tell the story of this mountain, said Plunkett, gesturing to the painted walls. This place had stories many thousands of years before our ancestors walked its forests. We are such a funny race, humans compelled to scratch our lives out in ink, on paper, or rock. Whether it's the limestone wall or the pulp pages of a comic book, I suspect it's hardwired in our DNA, the urge to record our lives. Daniel said nothing, but he thought of the drawings that lined the walls back in the tree fort. Generations of extraordinary children who'd scribbled down a record of their lives in pencil and crayon. As if reading Daniel's mind, Plunkett pointed to the framed photographs behind him. These are my humble contributions to history. 
a wall of remembrance for those who came before. My hall of would-be heroes. Daniel squinted at the photos and thought it was too dark to see any details from where he was lying. One thing was certain, they were all pictures of children, generations of children. So you collect what? Pictures of your victims from over the years? Victims! Hardly, I saved each and every one of these children. I saved them from themselves. So we are in Mount Noble. I, I, I mean, which fire mountain? Yes, Plunkett smiled. Resisting comfortability in the belly of the beast. That turn of phrase sent a chill through Daniel. He didn't like to think about resting in the belly of anything. And what about my friends? Daniel asked, remembering the sight of their bodies strewn about the ground. Are they all right? They are fine. They were a bit stunned by my grand entrance, but no more permanent danger was done. In fact, I believe they are on their way to rescue you even now. Daniel let go of a sigh of relief with it, his greatest fear that his friends had been hurt or worse in that confrontation with the shroud. Interesting move. Recruiting that Gudgeon's boy to use against me. Here I have taken away your king, said Plunkett, gesturing to Eric's still form. And you go and move one of your pawns to replace him. That took first-class strategic thinking. Plunkett leaned in close, his creepy smile wide. Do you play chess, Daniel? Yes. Cool. Then I'm glad my metaphors are at least aren't wasted on you. Wasted on me? What are you talking about? You kidnapped me, attacked my friends. Daniel knew that he might be pushing it too far. He feared the anger lurking inside the old villain, but he couldn't stop. These games had gone far enough. Why don't you end all of this? To his surprise, Plunkett just smiled. You are burning with questions, aren't you? Always the detective, even to the bitter end. I like that about you. Very well. Ask away. I will indulge you with an answer or two. You will find that I can be generous when it suits me. Ask. Okay, then. Who are you? I mean, really, are you Herman Plunkett? Or the Shroud? Where does... Herman in and the Shroud began, Plunkett said. Is the Shroud Herman's secret identity, or is Herman the Shroud's? Plunkett chuckled, and Daniel squirmed at the sound of the laughter. There was a frayed edge to the old man's voice that had been well hidden until now. So, everything you told me was a lie. You lied to me, and you framed Eric for all of it. Not everything was a lie. I told you what you needed to know and fed you the information that suited me and my purposes. It's true that I used to turn your friends against each other, but it was necessary, I assure you. The special children of Noble's Green were no match for my power until you showed up and began uniting them against me. I couldn't have you all standing together. So I manipulated you to get you and your friends away from Eric. And without his strength, the rest of your friends will be little bother, even with the help of that cudgeon's boy. I brought you here in part to say thank you. Daniel bit back the urge to tell him where to put his thanks. 
Instead, he decided to press him for more information. What is this place? A hidden network of caves that runs throughout the mountain. They were used as homes by primitive people many thousands of years ago. Most collapsed long ago. This one was only uncovered by chance by the quarry company, which I own, of course. Plunkett sat back in his chair, his face practically breaking with that smug grin of his. That smile made Daniel sick to his stomach. Still, there had to be some value in keeping him talking. Plunkett had at least revealed that Molly and the others were on their way to rescue him, though they did not seem to worry the, the villain in the slightest. It was up to Daniel then to discover something that they could turn to their advantage. Daniel's fascination with Sherlock Holmes came from Holmes' mastery of the details. Holmes viewed every situation as a giant puzzle, and the details that ordinary people missed were often the pieces that put it all together. If he kept Plunkett talking, perhaps the old man would reveal something that Daniel might use against him. Something in the details. So, you own the quarry, which basically means that you own most of Mount Noble. Plunkett made a sour face at the mention of Noble's name, but he nodded. But why, Daniel asked, what use are a bunch of cave paintings if you are just going to hide them from the rest of the world? Think it through, Daniel. You've seen the paintings. These caves are a history. They are proof. Proof of what? Proof that this has all happened before, and it will happen again. The storm is coming, Daniel, and we must be prepared to torment it. To meet it, Plunkett chuckled. He was making less and less sense, and Daniel began to wonder if the old man was finally slipping into total madness. You said that some of what you told me at your house was true, said Daniel. I saw your photograph, you were at St. Albans, but you were just a boy. Correct. The brothers of St. Albans took in unwanted children from all over the world. Those street urchins and castoffs were lucky enough to be rescued by the brothers who were given a new life in the orphanage. I was the unluckiest of the lucky few. Daniel decided to try out a few guesses to keep the old man talking. And when St. Albans burned, Johnny Noble rescued you from the fire. Also true. Johnny saved the children of St. Albans. I watched it all happen. I witnessed how the great gifts were bestowed that night. When the media struck the orphanage, the whole place was consumed in green flame the color of a distant star. It moved like a thing alive, and it killed without mercy a witch of fire. It would have taken the children too, if not for Johnny. Stupid, lucky Johnny. A dumb backwoods trapper who saw the fire fall from the sky and ran in to help. Without a second thought, he charged into that inferno and emerged different. It was something in that smoke, I think. Something that got in their lungs. It could not kill them, so it changed them. It transformed them all. The old man's face contorted with rage. All but one. All but Herman Plunkett. Paul picked on Herman, who was hiding in the outhouse when the meteor hit. Poor Herman, who escaped the flames and missed his chance to become a god. Daniel was afraid of the white-hot anger in Plunkett's eyes, but he had to go on. There was a question that he had to have the answer to. And my Graham? Plunkett's rage instantly dimmed and his shrunken little body sank into a seat. 
For the first time, he seemed unwilling to meet Daniel's gaze. Yes. Her power was the strongest of them all. Next to Johnny's, of course. When she flew, Daniel, you should have seen her. She so, shone so bright like the sun. Daniel pictured Graham lying in her bed, so sick, so frail. And you took it from her, he said through gritted teeth. You stole it all away? No, shouted Plunkett on his feet. Not her. I didn't mean, I, I didn't mean to. It wasn't my fault. Plunkett began pacing back and forth now, wringing his hands as he went. The little trails of darkness followed in his every move. You have to understand. At first, I didn't know how to control it. And I would never have done that to Eileen if I had known then. I was never a popular boy. And all the other than St. Albans. She was, she was the only one who showed me a bit of kindness. I was fond of her. Plunkett's eyes grew distant again as he remembered. I saw what they could do. They emerged from that fire, changed all of them. I watched as they used their powers hesitantly at first, then bolder and bolder each day. It was a matter of time before they were discovered. Noble disappeared soon after the fire. That coward, and he left behind a dangerous legacy. Unchecked, all that power in the hands of children. He abandoned them. He abandoned me. And what's only my bad luck, that I wasn't one of them. I became obsessed, I admit it. I stalked the old wound, burned out ruins of the orphanage for some answer, some clue as to how or why this had happened. Eventually, my obsession paid off. In the rubble, I found a black stone a piece of the actual meteorite that had ignited the fire. I was ecstatic at the time. I suppose I hoped that the stone might give me the powers like the others. I nearly broke my neck jumping from trees with that stone clutched in my hands. I nearly burned myself alive trying to recreate that magic fire. But nothing worked. All I got for my troubles were bruises and singed eyebrows. The disappointment was just so much. I went to Eileen, and I broke down in her arms. She had continued to be kind to me, even though I was more of an outcast than ever. She took me flying, Daniel. Plunkett stopped now and wiped out one of his eyes. He had a faraway look on his face, and his mouth was twisted horribly. Whatever he was remembering, it was tugging at the old man's soul. I didn't mean to do it. One minute, Eileen was holding me, and the next, she was lying on the floor. She was breathing, but her skin was so cold. I, I was filled with flame. It was the meteorite, you see. In my desperation, I showed her the stone. And when she touched it, the media gave her those powers and the media took them away and gave them to me. The stone acted like a kind of siphon. Eileen's power came to me through that stone. Only it changed. Rather than being filled with a bright light, I was consumed by darkness. My darkness. And it did whatever I wanted it to. When Eileen awoke, she had no memory of what had happened to her or of her powers. The powers protect their secrets well, and when they left her, they took her memories with them. 
but I now had a secret of my own. Over the next few years, I discovered that I needed to replenish the powers of the stone ever so often. It needed to feed so that I might stay strong. The other children of St. Albans would have grown up to become menaces to society. Bullies with the powers of God. I took it upon myself to prevent such a tragedy. One by one, I took their power for my own. We fought here on the slopes of the mountain. Johnny was so much more powerful than I had expected. That first generation of supers, as you call them, was much stronger than those milksops you call friends. The powers have scattered and spread over the generations. Eric here is m remarkable because he can fly and he possesses strength. The Lee girl has speed to accentuate her flight. But back then, there was no limit to the powers a single child might have. You cannot imagine how strong Johnny was. He was a grown man, and since I'd only ever fought children, I underestimated him. In the end, I lost. I barely escaped. After that defeat, I resolved to hide and plan. I would face Johnny Noble again, and this time, I'd be ready for him. Unfortunately, I didn't get the chance. The Second World War began, and Johnny left for Europe. He never returned. I don't know if he survived the war or not, I never saw him again, regardless. I started the comic books as my personal revenge fantasy, but in time I found that it gave me great satisfaction to dream up Johnny's exploits and to profit off of them. When you came to see me bearing those old books, well, the irony was just too delicious to ignore. Daniel made a face at the memory of that encounter. So, all of this because of a meteor? A meteor hit, and Noble's Green instantly becomes a town of super children? Plunkett glowered at him. No, I did not say that. The meteor that struck St. Albans was certainly part of the witch fire comet. The alien energy from that comet changes humans somehow. The phenomenon is rare, and those certain children continue to display abilities similar to the orphans. None of the succeeding generations were nearly as powerful as that first. I don't know exactly how those powers are passed on. A recessive gene, perhaps? It's a mystery I have yet to solve. Plunkett rubbed at his chin and frowned. The fact that something about this place still baffled the old villain gave Daniel a small bit of satisfaction. So the rules and all of that, Daniel said, pressing him further. That was all you? Of course, answered Plunkett. Without Johnny to stop me, my path to power was assured. But I still needed order. A way to control the children while protecting my secret. And how else do you control a group of rowdy children? You give them rules to follow. But in the end, you became the villain, not a hero. I am the Earth's greatest hero, shouted Plunkett, starting at Daniel. For 70 years, I've kept this world from being overrun by these menaces. Imagine a world where the children were allowed to reach adulthood with all that power. Even this pathetic, weak patch. Imagine what kind of damage Clay Cudgens could do as a man fully grown. 
Daniel pointed to Eric's still form lying on the floor. Eric isn't Clay. He's a good kid, and all he wants to do is help people. That's true today. But what about tomorrow? Or next year? Or the year after that? Eric has yet to suffer jealousy. What will he do the first time he has his heart broken? What kind of man will he be then? We both know something of poor Eric's family. All his life, men have bullied him, pushed him around. What happens the day he decides to push back? Real life is not a comic book, Daniel. And we are all better off with Johnny Noble dead. This world doesn't need superheroes. No, just you, Daniel muttered, and immediately regretted it. He wondered if the old man might strike him, but the moment passed, and Plunkett soon let out one of his cackling chuckles. You try and test me, but I know that I am right, he said. We are like Holmes and Moriarty, battling wits, but will our struggle be our doom? I wonder, will tonight be Rickenbach of Oz? Plunkett removed an oil lamp from its sconce. Shining its light on the far wall, he pointed to the pointing stand. You see, Daniel. This has all happened before. Look, look, close boy, and tell me what you see. Daniel squinted in the gloom and looked at what appeared to be the scene of a battle. Armies with spears and knives fighting an enemy from above. An enemy from above. They're, they're flying, said Daniel. Yes! The tribes here fought a war that could not be won against the very gods themselves. Plunkett walked along the wall, illuminating the illustrated scenes as he went. The witch fire, they call it. A fire from the sky that bonded the mountain. It came only once in many generations, and only the very eldest of them would live to see it twice. They thought it was an evil spirit that lit the sky and burned the forest, scarring away the game that the tribes depended on for survival. Finally, one year, a generation of young warriors set out to meet the spirits of the witch fire in battle. The meteor fell from the sky and 20 young men marched out to meet it. Seven returned and they came back changed. They left us boys and they came back something more. The seven young warriors started out as protectors, but as they grew older, they became enemies to the tribe of all tribes. In time, they destroyed an entire people because no one was strong enough to challenge their power. In time, they destroyed themselves. That is the secret of the mountain, Daniel. But it's more than the past. It's the future that I am trying to prevent. By studying the cave paintings and by studying the geology of this place, I have calculated that the witch fire comet, whose spirit, or whatever it is, returns to this place every 70 or so years. Daniel quickly did the math in his head. That means that it is... It's coming back! And when it does, we must be ready. We? Plunkett nodded, his voice softening. <laughs> it is presumptuous of me to think that I can defend this world alone. I am an old man, and though the power of the stone has granted me the strength to live a long life, no one is immortal. Every man must leave behind a legacy. 
when the sky lights up with fire again, there will be born an entirely new generation of super beings. But they will not be, but they will be more powerful than the weak, deluded children of today. They will be like the gods of old, pure, strong, and dangerous. Plunkett reached into his sweater pocket and withdrew a small ring. It looked as if it were carved from coal, but there was a slight emerald sheen to it in the lantern's light. With my powers, it was an easy thing to make myself a rich man. The company that dug this quarry was just one of many that I owned. A limestone quarry was simply a convenient cover for the real work going on here. The real quest. We dug this quarry not to search for limestone, but to find this. What is it? Daniel asked, though he already knew the answer. Plunkett fingered the ring. It took years of digging and many millions of dollars to scrape together enough fragments of meteorite from the layers of the rock and earth just to fashion this ring, a second weapon to defend against the future. Plunkett held out his hand, the ring glittering in his palm, but it was worth it so that I might have an ally, a successor. That's what this is all about, asked Daniel, incredulous. You are the perfect choice. You're smart. Brave, and most importantly, you are not one of them. You are an outsider, just like I was. I never had a family, and there was no one to carry on what I am gone. Fate brought us together, and you can't fight fate, Daniel. Fate has to deliver to me, Eileen's grandson. And together we will keep this world safe. You will come to understand the wisdom of what I do and why I do it. I'm offering you a greater gift than has ever been offered. You can finally fly, Daniel. With time, you will be able anything. Daniel stared at the ring in Plunkett's hand. It was as if someone had taken the ground out from underneath his feet, and he was dizzy, poised to fall with only Plunkett's words holding him up. What will it do? Daniel asked, his voice barely a whisper. Will it me, me be like you? No, Daniel. It will make you like him. Plunkett said, pointing to Eric's still form. All of his powers will be yours if you are brave enough to take it. Daniel hardly heard the stone door moving behind him. He was only dimly aware of the sound of Molly's voice calling his name from somewhere far away. For the last three months, Daniel had watched his friends do the impossible. He had flown with them, played with them, and even occasionally fought against them all the while weighed down by the knowledge that he'd never be like them. Daniel knew what envy was. It was the ugliest of emotions. Plunkett was proof of that. But until now, he'd been able to keep his hidden deep down. It was easy when you had no other choice. But now, here was Daniel's chance to be special. To be more than the new kid. To be powerful. Daniel reached out. Plunkett dropped the ring into his palm. It felt cold and heavy in his hand, but he didn't put it on. He just stared at it. And beyond, he was aware of Eric's helpless form stirring in the dark. Good, Daniel, Plunkett said as tendrils of darkness slithered around the old man's body. The blackness flowed out from a burning ball of green flame beneath his sweater and its tentacles snaked through the folds of his clothing and wrapped around him until he was once again a living shadow. Now, 
he said in the shroud's throaty whisper. It's time to show your friends what real power is. Chapter 23, Rickenback Falls. Molly was the first to act, of course. It was a predictable move, not just because of her speed, but because of her anger. Daniel knew that she would be itching for a rematch and that first blood would belong to her. The supers had insisted that the Shroud fight them in the open, that much at least was good planning. They had no desire to face Plunkett in the shadows and confined quarters of the cave, and Plunkett seemed willing to oblige. He flew out of the tunnel like a shot, his eerie laughter echoing off the quarry walls. But thanks to Rohan, the supers were ready. No sooner had Rohan shouted his warning than Molly pressed her attack. She aimed for his legs, and at the speed she was moving, it must have felt as if he'd been hit by a car. Knocked off balance, the child tumbled down the hill to the bottom of the ravine where Clay was waiting for him. Clay's first punch set the shroud soaring through the air, slamming him against the quarry's stone face. As the shadowy villain slumped to the ground, Bud started laughing, polluting the air with his sour stench. Look at that, Clay, giggled Bud. You clocked him with one punch. Clay spat onto his hand and wiped it onto his dirty jeans. There was a dark sheen of something stuck to his knuckles. Yeah, but it's like hitting an oil slick. Thought you guys said this guy was going to be tough. Clay turned his back on Plunkett and glared up at the rest of the group. You losers weren't scared of that? Don't turn your back on him. Stick to the plan, shouted Rohan. But it was too late. There was a hissing noise, a rustle of movement, and from the shroud's crumpled body, a long tendril of darkness spun toward Clay, lassoing his neck in a noose. Strong child, whispered Plunkett. Now it is my turn. The tendril twisted as the shrouds floated up into the air, and Clay's face turned blue with the effort to breathe. Bud was no longer laughing. Time for plan B, shouted Molly. What's plan B? asked Rohan. Hit him. Hard. She flew at Plunkett again, but this time he was ready. She struck a wall of blackness that tangled around her arms and legs. She might just as well have flown into a tar pit. Bud was next, his cloud of noxious gas engulfing the shroud, but to no effect. Whatever the shroud stuff was made of it, it protected him from Bud's attack. From the entrance of the cave, Daniel watched as the Shroud took down the Supers, two offensive fighters. Without Clay or Molly, the battle was over. The rest of the group just didn't know it yet. As Daniel watched, Louisa appeared next to Molly, phasing right through a boulder to reach her. She was trying to free Molly from the tar-like blackness, but she seemed to be making matters worse as the clinging stuff spread over Molly's body, almost as if it had a mind of its own. Bud and Rohan were desperately tugging at the noose around Clay's neck, but to no avail. Clay was strong and nearly indestructible, but he was gasping for breath that wasn't there. Even he couldn't last much longer. And through it all, Daniel did nothing. He turned his back on the battle and walked back into the cave to sit by Eric's side. Already the color was returning to his friend's face and his breathing was getting stronger. He had lived. But by the time he woke up, it would be too late. The Shroud would have already won. All of this, Daniel said softly, he's doing all of this because of me? Because he thinks I'm like him. I'm so sorry, Eric. You're going to lose and there's nothing I can do to help. I'm not like you. I'm no leader. All my plans led us here right into his hands. Now he's going to win and I'm going to be powerless to stop it. And he'll open his fist, exposing the coal black ring cupped in his palm. Unless, unless, unless what? Asked a small voice behind him. Daniel turned and looked for a speaker, but no one was there. Rose, he asked, is that you? I'm not supposed to say, answer a voice from nowhere. 
Luisa told me to stay disappeared and to be quiet until it was all over. Run home, Rose. You should run home as fast as you can. But Luisa said, it's too late, Rose. We lost. Aren't you going to help them? What's in your hand? Is, is it something to help them? Asked Rose, suddenly visible by Daniel's side. She was reaching for the ring in Daniel's palm. No, he said, pulling his hand away from her. You can't touch it. It will hurt you if you do. I'm sorry, I just, I just don't know what to do. But even as Daniel said it, he knew that it wasn't exactly true. He had the ring. Please, shouted Rose, tears filling her eyes. You're the smart one. Louisa always says, so help them. Daniel gripped the ring so tightly in his fist that he could feel it cutting into his flesh. The ring was an incredible source of power, but power at what cost? He might be able to use it against Plunkett, but first he'd have to use it against his friends. Incredible source of power. Then the answer hit him like a bolt from the sky. He felt that familiar rush, the excitement that he got when the final piece of a puzzle came together. Stay here, Rose, and look after Eric. You're right, I am the smart one, and I just figured out how to beat him. Shoving the ring into his jeans pocket, he ran along the tunnel, out into the open and toward the battle. He felt smart, he felt brave, and he felt ready for a fight. Plunkett had made a mistake, one so obvious that Daniel had almost missed it. That old man had lived in a world of comic book villains for too long. I know how to beat you. He cheered as he bounded down the steep incline, careless of how much he stumbled or fell. The shroud looked up and Daniel could feel the old man's angry glare from within the cowl of the shadow. Don't be foolish, Daniel. This is your moment as much as it is mine. The ooze stopped and spread over Molly. Rohan and Bud seemed to be making headway in freeing clay. Apparently, Plunkett's traps needed his full concentration to work, and if nothing else, Daniel had just bought his friends a little more time. You're going too far. You're out of control, said Daniel. Sometimes sacrifices have to be made, said Plunkett. But you can save their lives, Daniel by taking their power for your own and ridding them of their memories of all this. Leave them powerless. We'll watch as they suffer the ultimate fate. Plunkett wasn't bluffing. Daniel could tell. The years of secrecy and loneliness had finally driven the old man insane. For all these years, Plunkett had deluded himself into believing that he was acting for the good of the world, while somewhere in the twisted recesses of his mind was the knowledge that he was really just a villain. The truth was there in his art, in those comics he had drawn so many years ago, in which he reduced himself to a lurking shadow, preying upon the sleeping, the defenseless. He wanted Daniel to help him continue the lie. He needed an ally to keep him from facing the truth, and he was willing to kill to get one. You said it yourself, Plunkett, said Daniel, taking another step toward him. You needed to keep Plunkett talking, to keep him distracted until he could get close enough for what he had planned. You told me that Graham was full of light. She might have changed the world, but you stole that from her. I won't steal that same gift from my friends. I'm not like you, and I never will be. Though Daniel couldn't see the expression on Plunkett's face, he still felt the old man's fury. His rage was like a living thing, palpable in the very air around him. If you want to honor your grandmother's memory so, yes, then you can join her. Daniel read headlong at the shroud, but only made it a few feet. From within the darkness of the shrouds being came another tendrils of blackness whipping around Daniel's neck with an iron grip. But unlike Clay, Daniel wasn't invulnerable. He had no super strength to protect him. With just a flick, Plunkett would snap 
Dangle snack. Goodbye, Daniel. Such a waste. The world's greatest detective has chest medicine. Just then, the earth seemed to crack open. With a thunderous crash, the quarry erupted in a shower of wind and dust, blinding Daniel and driving him to his knees. When his vision cleared, he saw that he was free of the shroud's tentacle and that Plunkett had engaged a new enemy. It looked like a scene drawn by the old man himself, an epic battle between the shroud and his arch enemy, Johnny Noble. Only that wasn't Johnny Noble, it was Eric. Daniel had never seen anything like it. Though Eric was obviously still somewhat dazed, seeing his friends in danger had unleashed a new rage in him. Black tendrils lashed at his face and hands, but he shrugged them off, oblivious to the bloody red welts that they left on his body. Through an act of sheer will, he thought he fought his way past Plunkett's defenses, and when the two superpowered beings collided, the entire quarry shook with violence. Daniel heard someone call its name, and he turned to see Molly and the rest of the group scrambling over the rocks to reach him. They were all there. Even Rose had appeared in their midst. Clay was conscious, and Daniel found some amusement in the fact that it was Rohan who was helping him limp along. Daniel, are you all right? asked Molly, her voice barely audible over the sounds of Eric's furious fighting. Daniel nodded, his eyes locking on the struggle raging nearby. We have to help Eric, she shouted. He won't be able to keep this up for long. Rohan was saying something, but his words were lost in the cacophony around them. What? Daniel yelled. I said, shouted Rohan, moving closer, that we need to get out of here. This quarry is as stable as it looks, and the fighting is going to bring the walls down on top of our heads. I can hear the rumbling already. We can't leave Eric, said Molly. We won't, said Daniel. I promise. The tide was turning. Strong as Eric was, he was clearly no match for the Shroud's powers, and he was weakening fast. Clay, said Daniel, can you still fight? Clay shrugged and spat. Yeah, I heal pretty fast. I was just a little lightheaded, is all. That creep jumped me while my back was turned. But for all of Clay's bluster, he still seemed wobbly on his feet. Daniel hoped that the bully-turned-ally would be strong enough to last at least a few rounds against the Shroud. What's the plan? asked Rohan. The plan is that you and Bud take Louisa and Rose to safety. Your powers aren't going to help you against the Shroud. And what about you? asked Rohan. You don't have any powers at all. No, but I figured out Plunkett's weakness. Besides, I owe it to Eric. Now, go! Get out of here. We'll join you when we can. Rohan looked as if he were ready to argue, but in the end he just nodded. When he turned to gather up the troops, he noticed that Bud was already halfway up the trail. Did I have to ask him twice? Rohan muttered. Louisa surprised Daniel with a quick quiz, with a quick kiss on the cheek. Be careful, Daniel. Daniel hoped that the grime on his face sufficiently covered that he was blushing. One look at Molly told him that it did it. Rohan led the others after Bud and Daniel wasted no time watching them go. Here's what we do. Clay, you need to go get in there and help Eric. Then while Plunkett's distracted, Molly, I need you to get me as close to him as you can. Why? Clay asked. What can you do? Daniel allowed himself a small grin. It's always in the details. Plunkett slipped up and told me the source of his power. Now I just have to take it from him. Tell me, said Molly. I'm faster. No, said Daniel. You can't touch it, either of you. If you do, you'll end up like Simon. It's gotta be me. Well, new kid, you're no coward. I'll give you that, Clay said, cracking his knuckles as he talked. As for me, time for round two. Then Clay Cudgeons ran down the side of the ravine to join the fight. No longer on the defense of the shroud had Eric cornered against the rock wall of the quarry. Large chunks of limestone fell around them as they traded blows. Daniel worried that soon Eric would be unable to defend himself. Then nothing would prevent Plunkett from stealing Eric's powers and adding them to his own. 
Molly let out a low whistle as Clay blindsided the shroud and brought him tumbling to the ground. I never thought I'd say it, but I'm glad Clay Cudgens has our backs. It was an all-out scrap now as the three of them tumbled and rolled across the quarry floor. In the kicked up dust and gravel, it was hard to tell the combatants apart. Meanwhile, an ominous rumbling had become audible to even Daniel's ears. Pretty soon, the whole quarry was going to come crashing down around them. Okay, Molly, said Daniel, putting his arms around her neck. The next opening you see, go for it. Fly me straight into it. Are you sure about this? Not at all, but it's the best chance that we've got. Molly wrapped her arms around his waist and smiled, but her eyes were glued to the scene below. Daniel didn't have time to respond because at that moment, the shroud let out a fierce shout of victory as he threw his enemies to the ground. He brought himself to his full height, the black tentacles of shadow forming into long, jagged spikes above the heads of Eric and Clay. Molly reacted quicker than lightning. She flew so fast that Daniel hardly had time to register any movement at all. One moment he was standing on the hill holding on to her, and the next he was hitting what felt like a wall of bricks. Layer upon layer of the thick shadow stuff flooded his vision as she struggled to keep him from suffocating in the dark. But Daniel knew that there was a solid body underneath that darkness, Plunkett's body. As the shroud, Plunkett had the strength to snap Daniel in two, but it took concentration from those powers to work, and Plunkett was currently busy with Molly, who was delivering a flurry of punches at lightning speed. Through Molly's blows did little real harm, Plunkett was momentarily knocked off balance from the sheer ferocity of her attack. Hopefully a moment would be all that Daniel needed, because a moment was all that he would get. Daniel groped in the dark, searching for the shroud's burning heart. His hands found the fabric of Plunkett's sweater. The answer was in the details, and the most important detail about Plunkett's powers was that they came from an outside source, the meteorite stone. Plunkett had fashioned an one stone into a ring, but Daniel hadn't noticed any rings on Plunkett's fingers. That meant that he wore his stone in some other way, around his neck, perhaps near his chest. There was a sudden hiss as Plunkett realized what Daniel was searching for. They were soon locked in a fierce wrestling match, Daniel's hand closing in on Plunkett's throat as Plunkett tried to get a grip on the boy to throw him off. Pain shot up Daniel's bad arm, but he ignored it. He willed himself to keep moving, his fingers to keep searching, clawing at the collar of Plunkett's shirt. And there, he found it, strung on a chain around the old man's neck. Daniel's fist closed around the smooth stone pennant in the center of that ball of fire. It burned in his hands and he refused to let go. He tugged hard, but the chain held. Daniel's breath was being forced out of him as the vicious blackness pressed into his mouth and down his nose. He's, he's drowning me, Daniel realized. He's drowning me in shadow. Daniel's lungs burned and his stomach retched as the oily stuff seeped down his throat. His head started swimming and his eyes began to glaze over with a different kind of darkness. He was losing consciousness and soon he would lose his life. Just as he was gathering his remaining energy for one last pull, he felt arms around his waist tugging at him, lending him their weight, their own strength. There was a deafening rumble, but he couldn't tell if it was the sound of the walls falling or the blood pounding in his own ears. Like a human chain, the fighting children of Noble's Green pulled together and Daniel felt a snap as the stone yanked loose in his hands. As the world collapsed around him with a roar, the ground seemed to open up beneath him and together with his enemy, he tumbled into blackness. I will conclude today's reading. We have one more reading, the conclusion and resolution of this story. Thank you for tuning in to listen to me read Powerless by Matthew Cody. As a reminder, your activities for today, draw a picture of one of the scenes that happened in the story and write a short one paragraph summary of what took place in the story, who, what, where, when, why. Thank you. Stay awesome. Talk to you soon.